Manhattan. The application is for the termination of the tax exemption, of the prior tax exemption, and for the approval of a new tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law for three fully occupied buildings totaling 68 rental units and one superintendent unit in East Harlem in Manhattan. The subcommittee held a public hearing on this item on August 14th. Councilmember Ayala is supportive of this application, and she is here today to speak in favor of that item. Councilmember Ayala. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today to express my support for art an Article 11 tax exemption for triple HDFC project in today's agenda. This exemption includes a 10% set aside for formerly homeless families and establishes this uh, occupancy restrictions and households earning between 40% to 160% of the AMI. This deepens the current occupancy restrictions, which vary between 90% and 250% of the AMI. Additionally, this exception will allow the borrower to invest in capital upgrades for the properties, including facade restoration and energy efficiency measures. Preserving affordable housing is, a criti is as critical um, as low income and moderate families continue to struggle to find housing in our city. I am proud to have negotiated this agreement and would like to thank our partners at HC, uh, HPD, as well as Jeff Ewing from the Council land use team for their efforts uh, and I would also like to thank my staffer Bianca Medina who spent a lot of time on the phone uh, going back and forth to ensure that we got the deepest uh, affordability uh, possible for future residents but also that we included the 10% set aside for homeless families because I believe that every project moving forward uh, should include a 10% set aside for homeless families if we uh, have any plans of eradicating our current uh, homeless situation thank you Thank you, and I think one thing I just want to take exception to and recognize is this building at Triple H DFC somehow had quote unquote affordable housing at 250% of the AMI and I think that's somewhere around $200,000 a year and I don't think that our city should be building affordable housing for people making almost a quarter of a million dollars a year. Uh, and it, and I, it seems that we both agree on that and you are a champion in terms of lowering that. And uh, I believe the maximum unit uh, w will be uh, a, a fraction of that 250%. So thank you for your strong advocacy and we are proud to support you. We will also be voting on land use item 186, the Nueva Era Apartments tax exemption application for property at 287-289 Audubon Avenue in Councilmember Rodriguez's district in Manhattan. This application is for the termination of the prior Article 5 tax exemption and the dissolution of the redevelopment company which owns the site and for approval of a new Article 11 tax exemption under the private housing finance law for this fully occupied 34 unit residential building with rents currently capped at 30% of household income. Vacant units will be rented to households earning up to 50% of AMI. The subcommittee held a public hearing on this item on August 14th. The local council member is supportive of the application. We will also be voting to approve land use item 187, the Deschler apartment application for properties located in council member Perkins district in Manhattan. The application is for the termination of a prior article Five tax exemption and dissolution of the redevelopment company which owns the site and for approval of a new article 11 tax exemption under the private housing finance law. Subject property consists of two fully occupied seven story multiple dwelling buildings containing a total of 60 residential units which rent is capped at 30% of household income. Vacant units will be rented to households earning up to 50% of AMI which is very low income and a great target. The subcommittee held a public hearing on this item on August 14th. The local council member is supportive of the application, it should be also noted that one of the buildings was already uh, had an accessible entrance. Another building, we inquired about adding accessibility, and the developer has agreed to uh, make an at-grade entrance available to anyone in the building who is facing a mobility disability, uh, which will allow them to not enter from the main entrance, but through a side entrance with a special key. We will also be voting to approve six applications for tax exemptions related to in-rem actions in Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. They are land use items 177 and 178 in Queens, 179 and 180 in Brooklyn, and 181 and 182 in the Bronx. 
Land use items 177, 179, and 181 are all applications for tax exemptions pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law for unimproved properties in Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. Land use items 178, 180, and 182 are for applications for urban development action area project approval, waiver of the area designation, UDAP tax exemptions, and Article 11 tax exemptions for improved property in Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. The properties affected by these applications have already been approved by the Council for transfer pursuant to the City's third party transfer program administered by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. As stated at the hearing on these applications on August 14, 2018, the third party transfer program was created in 1996 as an alternative to the City owning and managing uh, in rem, which in otherwise may refer to as abandoned properties. Under the program, when the city forecloses on properties for unpaid taxes, ownership can be transferred directly to a nonprofit organization. Neighborhood Restore is the name of that nonprofit organization, which will work with qualified nonprofit and for profit developers to stabilize, manage, and plan for the rehabilitation and future ownership of these properties. Each of the individual council members with the affected properties in their district was supportive of the transfer, and each is also supportive of the tax exemptions we are about to vote on. I will note that between the time of the transfer was approved today and today's vote, a number of additional properties have been carved out or removed from the list of properties to transfer. Those 30 transfers being removed are listed in a HPD letter to the speaker dated September 4th. In the Bronx, the properties being removed are 2015 Grand Avenue, 1103 Franklin Avenue, 3732 Laconia Avenue, 1314 Oakley Street, 490 East 181st Street, 941 Rogers Place, 1015 Longfellow Avenue, 483 Willis Avenue, 3175 Villa Avenue, 1970 Morris Avenue, 803 East 182nd Street, 943 West 179th Street, 875 Longfellow Avenue, 757 East 169th Street in Brooklyn, uh, the properties that are being pulled out are 737 Sheffield Avenue, 721 Van Sicklin Avenue, 413 East 23rd Street, 766 Miller Avenue, 1016 Green Avenue, 106 Moore Street, 1141 Green Street, 897 Park Place, 11 Spencer Place, 315 Hartman Street, 5614 6th Avenue, 56. 566 Williams Avenue, 2838 West 19th Street, 463 Classen Avenue, and in Queens, 29-2357 Street, 39-2157 Street. In response to questions from this committee, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development has actually changed the term sheet for all third party transfers moving forward, lowering the level of affordability uh, from just uh, from allowing to target high moderate income individuals at 150% of AMI down by 30% to a maximum of 120% of AMI. So all of the units in this program when they become vacant will no longer be available to people making 150% of AMI will, will be on a more affordable group of 120% of AMI and lower. That being said, we've been assured by HPD that in previous third party transfers, 90% of the units were at 80% of AMI or lower. We are expecting that HPD continue their uh, performance of having 90% of the units below 80% of AMI. Uh, we will continue to do oversight and watch over these, pro these properties and ensure that they remain affordable as they become vacant. In addition, uh, we also noted in reviewing these applications that uh, the properties went to nonprofit developers and for profit developers, and the for profit developers appear to get buildings with more units than the nonprofit developers, which got buildings with fewer units. Uh, and that is something we'll continue to look into. I'd like to now call for a vote of land use items 177, 178, 179, 180, 181, 182, 183, 186, and 187 as amended by the letter on September 4th. Uh, Council, please call the roll. Vote to approve LUs 177, 178, 179, 180, 181, 182, 183, 186, and 187. Chair Kalos. Aye and all. Deutsch. Aye and all. Diaz. 
I know and I would like to congratulate my colleague, my Puerto Rican woman colleague, with her wonderful work and her concern for the community and El Barrio. Thank you. The land use items are approved by a vote of three in the affirmative, no negatives, and no abstentions. And we will leave the vote open. We'll leave the vote open, and we'll now start our public hearing on two items. We will hear together land use items 184 and 185 related to Article 11 tax exemptions for property in Riverside Drive in Manhattan. Land use 184 is related to property located at 638-640 Riverside Drive, Block 2088, Lot 9 in Councilmember Levine's District. HPD seeks approval for a new Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The property is an existing partially occupied 12-story building with 133 rental units, which includes 99 occupied units, 34 vacant units. The building receiving a 40-year, the building received a 40-year Article 11 tax exemption in 2013, which runs through 2043. However, the building is undergoing much needed rehabilitation and construction loan was closed in 2018 with a 30-year term running through 2048. Thus, the current Article 11 tax exemption would be terminated and replaced with a new 40-year tax exemption that coincides with the term of the permanent loan. The building is anticipated to convert to cooperative ownership this fall. The 34 vacant units would have income restrictions of 120% of AMI and rent restrictions at 100% of AMI. Land use 185 is related property located at 642-644 Riverside Drive, Block 2088, Lot 114. Also in Council Member Levine's district, HPD seeks approval of an, a new Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The subject property is an existing partially occupied 12-story building with 93 rental units, which includes 78 occupied units and 15 vacant units. The building received a 40-year Article 11 tax exemption in 2003, which runs through 2043. However, the ownership has recently undertaken substantial rehabilitation is now seeking a 40-year permanent financing loan. The term of the permanent loan would run, from 20, run through 2058, which does not align with the Article 11 tax exemption. Thus, the current Article 11 tax exemption would be terminated and replaced with a new 40-year tax exemption that coincides with the term of the permanent loan. The building is anticipated to convert to cooperative ownership in the fall. The 15 vacant units would have income restrictions of 70% of AMI and rent restrictions of 60% of AMI, making this the more affordable building. Uh, I'd like to now uh, open up the public hearing on land use items 184 and 185. Before inviting HPD to present testimony, I'll invite Councilmember Levine to provide some opening remarks on the record. Thank you, Chair Kalos, and you give a very thorough description of the project, so I don't feel the need to add a lot. I just want to briefly recount, this has been a long saga for these two buildings that were taken over from a neglectful landlord in 2003 through the NREM program. And these tenants uh, collectively uh, have worked intensely for 15 years to achieve the dream of home ownership. Um, they were engaged, they were passionate, they were active and capable, and this proves to me really the strength of the home ownership model, um, the power of giving people control over their desti destiny as homeowners, uh, and to get to the finish line on this deal, to turn these buildings into co-ops, we do need to extend the Article 11, that's what today's about, and today's hearing is about. What will emerge are co-ops that are going to be truly affordable. And uh, HDFCs come in many, many different flavors. Um, and, and some have uh, less strict income requirements uh, for historic reasons. But this building out of the gate, these two buildings out of the gate, are really going to be um, pretty solidly targeted towards people who would not have an opportunity for home ownership otherwise, certainly not in Manhattan, with uh, target AMIs of, I believe, 60%. And something that you don't see in a lot of buildings, which is a, uh, a limit on assets of 175% of AMI. And that can prevent someone who might be very um, uh, wealthy, but just out of college and not, let earn, yet, not yet earning a lot um, from gaming the system. So uh, I believe there will also be restrictions on sale price, which maybe 
our panel can describe. So, um, and lastly, I want to acknowledge, I'm not sure if the chair mentioned, that there has been significant public investment uh, to bring these buildings up to um, safety and other standards with, uh, I believe it's uh, 15 million in 644 Riverside and 23 million in 640. Um, and that's going to help um, the, make ensure that the tenants inherit buildings which are um, recently renovated and livable and safe without inheriting the full debt burden of that. So all in all, I think this is a, a real win for the residents and uh, for our collective goals of affordable home ownership. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, the opportunity to speak and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. I'll now instruct the uh, committee council to uh, swear in the uh, panel. Before responding, please hit the button on your mic, state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Anya Irons, yes. Nelson Chan, yes. Genevieve Michael, yes. Lee Wachowski, yes. Please begin your testimony. Uh, again, Genevieve Michael from HPD. Uh, land use numbers 184 and 185 consists of exemption areas related to 640 and 644 Riverside Drive in Manhattan Council District 7. These two buildings were part of an in-rem foreclosure action initiated by the city and transferred to Neighborhood Restore HDFC in 2003 under the, under the third party transfer program, TPT, round two. In 2004, Neighborhood Restore conveyed the buildings to Shuhab Housing Development Fund Corporation, which is a not-for-profit organization created by Settlement Housing Fund, Inc., working with Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, UHAB. Both of these entities are not-for-profit affordable housing organizations. The two buildings together were to be developed during the same time frame and converted to cooperative home ownership. Land use number 184 is related to 640 Riverside Drive, block 2088, lot 74, and is known as TPN 209G2. It is a 12-story elevator building with 133 residential units, of which 99 are occupied and 34 are vacant. The unit mixture comprises of six studios, 56 one-bedroom, 52-bedroom, 23-bedroom, and one four-bedroom apartments. Household income for existing occupants averages 41% of AMI, and rents are restricted to 55% of AMI. Land use number 185 is related to 644 Riverside Drive, block 2088-114, and is known as TPN 209G. This building is also a 12-story elevator building with 93 units, of which 76 are occupied and 17 are vacant. The unit types comprise of nine one-bedroom, 27 two-bedroom, 33 three-bedroom, 21 four-bedroom, and, five, and three five-bedroom apartments. Household incomes for existing occupants uh, have self-reported their incomes with an average of 69% of AMI, with maintenance charges at 60% of AMI. Currently, 644 Riverside Drive has been rehabilitated, while work has not started at 640 Riverside Drive due to a number of issues, including tenant relocation and work scopes, which affected timing. Therefore, HPD has determined that the project should be bifurcated with two standalone projects with SHF as sponsor for 644 Riverside Drive and UHAB as the sponsor for 640 Riverside Drive. As mentioned, 644 Riverside Drive has been rehabilitated and now has new elevators, plumbing, boiler, water heater, electrical upgrades, new roof, new kitchens and bathrooms, facade work, lobby doors, laundry room, windows and compactor. The development cost the participation the development cost through the participation loan program totaled $15,800,339. 640 Riverside Drive will undergo construction by a different general contractor with a new participation loan. The scope of work has been finalized and is similar to the scope developed for 644 Riverside Drive. Tenants at 640 Riverside Drive will temporarily relocate in phases throughout the construction period and relocation resources will be within the buildings as well as at 644 Riverside Drive. The estimated development cost for 640 Riverside Drive is anticipated to be $25,732,879 and no other subsidies are contemplated for this project. The property is slated for cooperative ownership conversion upon construction completion if tenants meet all of the TPT milestones and responsibilities. 
644 Riverside Drive is currently undergoing permanent loan and cooperative homeownership conversion and marketing of the vacant units will commence shortly through Housing Connect and under TPT program guidelines. Projected household income targets for the vacant units will be approximately 71% of AMI. As it currently stands, the buildings together have an existing Article 11 tax exemption that started in 2003. However, a new construction loan closed on June 29, 2018 with a 30-year regulatory agreement. Given the, current given the current financing cannot support a shorter amortization period for private debt to coincide with the current tax benefit obtained in 2003, new Article 11 exemptions are being requested for each building. In an effort to facilitate long-term affordability, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking approval of Article 11 tax exemptions for a period of 40 years that will coincide with the term of amended regulatory agreements. The approximate, approximate cumulative value of the Article 11 tax exemption for 640 Riverside Drive is $31,529,912 with a net present value of $8,808,000. Five hundred and fifty-one dollars, and for six forty-four Riverside Drive, the cumulative value is twenty-one million five hundred and seventy-three thousand eight hundred and fifty-four dollars, with a net present value of six million twenty-seven thousand one hundred and fourteen dollars. Thank you very much. Look forward to any questions from the committee. I would like to uh, thank uh, Councilmember Levine for his personal involvement in these projects. He is the most hands-on member. Uh, perhaps uh, on par with Councilmember Ayala. Both of them get great results for their districts. Uh, and then a recognition for his years of work on this, I'd like to turn it over to him to ask the first round of questions. Okay, thank you, Chair Kalos. Um, I want to clarify the AMI requirements for the new co-op. So you cite existing average occupant um, AMI at 69% for uh, Sorry, that's, is that 640? They're different, currently they're different AMI averages, right? That's 644. Okay, 644, and at 640 the, the current average is? 41. So will um, that burden residents who are um, below the targeted AMI with a maintenance that would be uh, pegged to someone who had a slightly higher income? So currently it's self-reported and only a fraction of folks actually, um, I believe, did the income surveys. So I think we, we can get a truer um, result if we went back and, and surveyed the place. But I, I think um, we will have, if subsidies are available, like Screedry and Section 8, that, that, will, that will be available for the tenants. Okay, so you're confident you can close the gap if there's someone who really can't afford the new maintenance through those various subsidies, despite the, the long waiting list, uh, particularly for Section 8? Yes. You're confident the city has adequate supply for that? Yes, if the city has a adequate supply, yes. Okay, um, and, and we were chatting before, so I don't know if, you're, if you have any clarification on the question of limits on the resale price mm -hmm. for either of these co-ops once they're established. If you don't know, that's fine. If, if that could be clarified at a later date, yeah, we can I'd be clarify. curious to know. Yeah, we'll get you the answer. We'll have exhibits to, um, to give you. But, but uh, I am correct that there's an asset restriction of 175% of AMI. Uh, is that correct? I think it's $175,000. Uh, so I, I misstated that when I spoke earlier. Thank you for clarifying. So, uh, uh, so that number uh, will not fluctuate over time the way that AMI would. Is that right? As of now, I think it's, it's at $175,000. But if you, in, in 30 years, uh, that might start to look like an unreasonably low number. Sure. Um, it, is there a provision for adjusting that to inflation? Not right now, but that's something that we'll definitely discuss internally. Is, has that come up uh, in internal discussions? It has discussions? not yet no. because it's no. relatively new. Right. right um, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this because of the, the future of these two very important buildings, but also because of the, the larger discussion underway now about future HDFC regulatory agreements. Mm -hmm. And um, to fix a number for 40 years uh, in an inflationary environment that should set off an alarm, I think. 
Um, you know, perhaps there's an easy mechanism for adjusting it over time, but mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know what that is. And um, I just want to make sure will there be uh, required uh, outside monitors in place for these buildings? Uh, also in line with what I've heard HDFD, H, uh, HPD propose for HDFCs going forward? Yes. Um, and who pays for the, the uh, cost of maintaining the monitor? I believe it comes out from the maintenance. The, the building will, will have to... And how much leeway do the residents have in selecting the monitor? Okay. Hi, Anya from UHAB. Um, for the first year, typically the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board or the sponsor right. uh, will, will be the monitor so that will be us and then they have complete freedom to change that contract after a year um, to choose any of the approved monitors. So the, re the residents would have that choice, Absolutely. is that right? Yeah, that we, we like to keep the consistency for the first year anyway. Of course, I understand. Um, and then they're free to choose. Uh, and I should just add to the who pays for it question. Um, we're currently exploring the possibility of having those funds regularly escrowed so that there's, for any monitor that should need to take our place, there is a reliable source of payment every year rather than um, invoicing the co-op once a year. Ah, so there'd be a monthly payment into an invoice or to this, an escrow account. Yeah, it'd be the right. same amount, but kind of broken up into smaller deposits into a reserve account. Right. Um, there are how many vacant units in both of the buildings? 640 has approximately 34 vacant units, I believe, is, um, and 644 has 17? 17. 17. Right. 17. And what is the procedure for selling those? That's the, we follow the HPD marketing guidelines, so it'll be a lottery process. When does that lottery open? Um, the lottery process for 644 can happen um, pretty soon after conversion, um, if, if not now, uh, because that plan has already been accepted for filing with the AG and they already have an effective plan. Okay. The complication there is that um, you have being successor sponsor is going to use those vacant units at 644 for relocation purposes for 640 tenants, just as they did right. in yeah. the prior development. So we plan to market, if they hire us to do the marketing, we would plan to market um, at a minimum seven months before occupancy is possible. Okay. And those are, those are HPD requirements, that you begin the process at least seven months before occupancy. So with respect to 644, we could really start as soon as we are comfortable that we don't need those units anymore. Yep. Um, and there are, there are six phases of relocation at 644, and only three of them require units in six, I'm sorry, there's six phases of, of relocation at 640, and there are only three phases needed of units in 644. Okay. So as soon as, the, <laughs> soon as you know the date of the lottery or as soon as it opens, please let us know, and we'd like to promote it in the neighborhood. Absolutely. Will there be a, a mandated minimum annual increase in the maintenance? Will that be 2 percent? Yes. So As per the regu regulatory agreement, I think that requires a minimum of 2 percent increase. Okay. And will there be a mandatory minimum flip tax? We, on 640, we have to work on what that is, but typically, yes. And w would that be 30 percent, or you don't know at this point? I, I don't know at this point. I think okay. there's a scale that the longer they stay, that... Ah, yeah. right. So... Uh, I'll share with you that schedule. Okay. Be curious to know what that is. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, excited about this project, and I'm going to pass it back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to uh, Councilmember Levine. Uh, when will, so 644 has been approved to become a co-op and when is that likely to happen? I think what we're shooting for, what will likely not happen is a, we're, we're still kind of splitting up the projects and we hope to have this happen simultaneously in November, December, right. but in any case 644 can go to permanent or and co-op conversion at that time, if, if the local law 11 work is completed and various other prerequisites are met. And what about 640? 
that would be at the end of construction at the uh, 24 month period. Okay, so that one. Or he just close in construction in June, so that's beginning their okay, construction. Okay, so that couldn't possibly become a cooperative until at least two years from now, which would be 2020. So I just want to correct my prior remarks during my opening, in which I represented that both would be going cooperative in 2018, and just uh, only 644 will, 640 will not. Uh, we just voted at HPD's insistence on 1,200 units, less units, buildings that were recently pulled out. And during that process, a lot of my questioning to the associate director related to why HPD needs 40 years for a Article 11. And one of my concerns was that a third party transfer building might not get off the ground properly. So in this case, 644 moved forward. The building was renovated. Is that correct? Yes. What happened with 640? It's been 15 years. I mean, I think what happened is, again, I'm Lee Wachowski. I'm general counsel of Settlement Housing Fund. And we're the parent of Shoe We may want to move a microphone over to you. We're the, we're the uh, parent of, of SHUHAB HDFC. Um, we originally felt, we and HPD together thought it would save money for everybody if we did the buildings together. And frankly, it was probably not the right decision. It was an enormous job. These are almost 100 units each. And we realized that we really needed to do one at a time. And the first building, 644, took a long time. And so basically 640, we did some of the common area rehabs and everyone then agreed we needed to do one at a time. We needed to finish 644 and then do 640. How, so how nutshell, long did it take really, to do 644? 644 took close to 10 years, unfortunately. And again, part of this was the relocation of tenants, temporary relocation of 12 tenants per line was an extremely time-consuming process. In addition, there was a lot of confusion about the scope of work based on what the 7A administrator supposedly had done. As we started work, we and HPD realized the scope had to be increased considerably, and that caused enormous delays as well. So unfortunately, it took much longer than we anticipated. So you, you've accounted for 10 years why didn't work at 640 start five years ago? Again, because the decision was we needed to finish 644 first. So we finished 644 didn't take 10 years, it took 15 years of construction. No, we, we acquired it, well, we acquired it in 2004, we finished at the end of 2014. Since then, we've been dealing with the co-op conversion. And again, it was sort of, we needed to deal with that until we could focus on 640. So, so there was no construction between 2014 and 2018 in, in 644. terms of 644? No, until we realized that the local law 11 work and the boiler needed to be done. So we started again. There when did that also, start again? There also. Uh, we uh, will need a microphone for you, please. Oh, sorry. I usually speak too loud. Um, there, there are also issues with some of the work that was done. We had a roughly a two year delay based upon some um, incorrect window work. Right. So 644 has 83 units. I don't remember exactly. 93. 93. I don't remember exactly how many windows, but they all needed to be replaced. And um, that was a lengthy process of. Right. Anya's right. Yeah, that, so, so that, that added in that, in that time period when no work was done, there was two years spent on that. There's really no, nobody's trying to make excuses for that, time, for that lag. It's, it's unacceptable to have projects take that long. But I, I do want to point out that for everyone, I believe it was a tremendous learning curve. It was the second round of TPT. Um, everybody involved wanted to be conservative and shouldn't have been conservative because they're, they needed a lot more work than originally anticipated. We had to do line by line. So for example, doing the plumbing in one line, make the determination that it had to be repaired, move on to the next line, check the plumbing, make the, so all of those are approvals and 
whatnot. Um, we also had tenant related issues with relocation. There's just every possible thing that you can imagine at a time to the project. Right. I mean, so. we're not, again, we're sorry it took so long. Our other TPT buildings did not. But if you think about it, 12 tenants, one tenant refuses to relocate. It's some of them it took a year in court to convince them to temporarily relocate. And line after line, yeah, again, we're sorry it took so long, but we did our best and, and get, did get it done. But yes, it what took is, longer than we would what have liked. What is the correct, what do you believe the correct timeline to be? And, and this is more, I guess, for HPD if you feel comfortable answering. So we just approved 1,200 units less the items that have been withdrawn. How, how, how long do you anticipate construction will take on those projects? The construction itself should take 18 months to 24 months. But if we need to relocate folks, that may take longer. It depends on tenant cooperations. That's why this is so much different than new construction, let's say. What is the anticipated timeline once you get when do you anticipate getting a construction loan on 640? We got one already. We, we closed, closed, that closed that in June. Okay. Yeah. We, and we're, we're beginning relocation um, this month, if not next month. So we're beginning to move the tenants already. Um, and, and how many tenants have you had to take to court? Or are you planning six, to or in the process? For 640, I believe we have like four, I, that might be wrong, um, no more than five folks that are not signing relocation agreements for various reasons. So we've brought them to, co to, to court to, um, to move that along. Um, one thing that I, I should mention about the timeline, while we have a construction timeline, there are other aspects that have to happen simultaneously and in conjunction with construction that need to go fluidly as well. The marketing process of vacancies is at a minimum a two-year process that just by virtue of going through a lottery, vetting all of those applications, getting approvals, doing interviews, that process for this many vacancies will take at least two years to complete. So, so the, the building that uh, Council Member Levine was enthusiastic about with the, uh, I believe it's 34 units in 644? No. 17 and 644. 17 and 644 that are ready today, ostensibly, will sit there vacant for two years? No, they're going to be generating income from the relocation process, and then as soon as we're done, we're going to market them. So they're going to be collecting maintenance, and the sponsor is responsible for making sure that they're maintained, repaired, and paid for. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm sorry if okay. I'm not making that clear. So, so, so the, the crosstalk was just Council Member Levin was pointing out that the 17 units would be occupied by folks from the other buildings who are in the relocation process. What is your timeline on completing construction on 640? I would say completing construction 18 to 24 as, as um, so, so in 2020, the construction will be done even though you have five folks that you have taken to court. So with those five folks in court and that process in 2020, the building will be done, and then how, and then how long for those 34 units to become available on the market? As soon as we have our budget fixed, we can prepare an offering plan and process through the Attorney General. So as soon as we know what the numbers are exactly, we can market and start the whole process. So typically that's we have waited till substantial completion, but we don't want to wait that long anymore. We want to start even sooner. I, I've asked this question of HPD before at similar hearings. Does, will HPD provide this committee a list of all the projects that were previously received third party transfer or Article 11 or any other funding through this committee or the Finance Committee that have not completed, that, that have not been gone through lease up and still have vacant units and are still pending construction and what have you. We'll discuss it internally and get back to you. I can share with you some statistics about UHAB's pipeline if that's of any use because we do consider ourselves possibly the largest TPT developer, not-for-profit TPT developer in the city. We've converted about 99 
uh, buildings. Of those 99 buildings, only five projects have gone rental. The majority of those because the tenants chose to be rentals versus co-ops. So that is a pretty, we consider those all successes really because it's always up to tenant choice. But out of the 99 buildings to have, you know, five go rental is, we believe, very, is a great success. That's just our little I, piece I of the pie. I understand. I guess, so we have third party transfer. It was a new program. You're involved in round two. You step into it, you realize there's luck. At what point in the 15 years did you reach out to HPD for assistance in managing both buildings? Well, actually, in terms of 644 and 640, we worked with HPD all along, and it just unfortunately took a long time. You know, there was a huge learning curve, and again, 100 units, 93 units. We actually, as I, you know, I'm thinking about it, we actually couldn't start for several years because of the court cases and a couple of tenants who refused to move. So that, that caused delays at the beginning. And again, it was the second round. But we worked with HPD. HPD was incredibly helpful. It was unfortunately just a very difficult building to do. What could HPD do different? Or what is HPD doing differently on third party transfer round 10, which we just approved, that makes that, that makes you confident that it will not take 10 or 15 years for the new third party transfer units to buildings to come back to this committee without having made much progress? Sure, I think it's communications first and foremost and working with council, city council to make sure we have that communication and often. And I think that that has been helpful actually. To, to be fair, I just asked if you would communicate with us about all the projects that might be considered stalled in a similar circumstance as 640 has been, and the, the answer was not an absolute yes. So are you willing to give me an absolute yes that you will communicate? <laughs> no. You know, look, I think everyone at HPD wants to work closely with the council to see how we can move these projects forward and especially the projects that are stalled I think generally actually involving the local council member as was the case with council member Levine only helps um, you know this is the first time I am getting that question so I don't want to make any commitments without talking to everyone else at the agency I, I think the answer should be undoubtedly yes you mentioned a uh, situation with having work done that was done incorrectly uh, can you tell me a little bit about the nature of the work that was already done and the work, nature of work that is planned to be done? Specifically, are the people who are doing the work, did they receive training? Did they have a chance to do on-the-job training? Did they get health insurance uh, so that if they got injured on the job, they could uh, go to a doctor? If they got hurt and they couldn't keep working, did they have disability insurance? Fifteen years later, are they going to be able to retire with a 401k or other pension vehicle uh, and, and what have you, and that's for the past construction and the construction moving forward. Um, with respect to the past construction, um, I, I just, the only real main fact that I can add that predates me, and, and Lee can maybe speak better to this, but one, one thing that HPD did very well and that helped the process a lot was in that case was they, they forced the removal of the contractor for 640. Um, the contractor was a very big problem with 644, and they, they listened to the issues and they removed them from the combined project at the time. So that's, that's one thing that they did well in that process. Um, your other question was uh, mostly about the contracting team on 640. I, I have a couple of notes Both here. 640 and 644. This, this took over. Yeah, a while. I'll do, I can only really speak for 640, honestly. Sure. Um, it's not my typical job to, to do the um, in house counsel and director of operation, operations, but I have notes from our contractor. Um, we're using MDG contracting. They are MD. MDG contracting. Okay. They are very, very experienced in in place renovations. So checkerboarding tenants um, around the building. They have completed at least one of our other projects ahead of schedule. They, they, I'll have to ask them specific, the very specific questions you asked about their employees. Are, are those values you, important to you as well? Yes, yeah, yeah, and I can tell you some of that, but I can't tell you about their 401ks and, and I, that, that I can't tell <laughs> Just want to know that they have access sure. to retirement. Sure, so they wrote in an email here that um, 
They are all, is it RRP certified, first of all, so they, re repairs and renovation, painting certified. They're all, all licensed, including the subcontractors. Um, they will be required to pay all the employees the living wage as required by the council, follow all um, FLSA requirements, including paying an hourly wage over time, over 40 hours of work, and all the workers must be paid weekly. Subcontractors are required to provide health care unless exempted in accordance with Obamacare. That's quote unquote. But if you want more information, I, I'm you, happy to get it for the, you. The record will remain open. So if by tomorrow you can get us specific yes or no answers uh, to the, the quality of conditions for your workers. Additionally, uh, you can help me with the math here, but at 15, at less than $15 and 15, at less than $15 an hour, do you believe that the workers who helped renovate these buildings will be able to qualify for this affordable housing? Oh, that's a good question. I'll, I'll get back to you. I would hope so. I'll, I'll get back to you. But I guess one of the things that I, I've heard the mayor say and I agree with him on is that one thing we can do to solve the affordable housing crisis is to pay people better so that they can be lifted out of poverty. Uh, in t terms of it, the MDG, is they, are they the contractor that did the incorrect work? And no. how to, which contractor did the incorrect work? Delwood, and again, this was quite a few years ago. And um, do, you, do you know if their folks had training? I, or? I really don't, and again, the work, the work ended four you, or five years ago. W w do you think that having folks who have training on the job training and benefits and what have you might produce better results and without having to redo the work? Well, I, I think what happened with 644, actually, uh, Delwood did do a, a good job. I Delwood did do a good job. Um, certainly, they were, we realized they did not have the expertise in dealing with occupied buildings, which is one of the reasons that HPD, we all agreed that for 640, we should use a different contractor. Um, the work that Delwood did was fine, except what happened with the windows, which we didn't realize till it was done, is their sub, they did not supervise the sub. And so the sub did not do a good job with the windows. And what Delwood did, and I will give them credit for it, is we called their attention to it, and they actually hired someone else, and they came back and basically redid all of the windows at their expense. I'm going to turn to Councilmember Levine for a question. Um, I'm trying to visualize the entrances and whether there are steps. Wondering about accessibility. Could you remind us whether these are accessible or can, or can be made accessible, at least the lobbies? I, I couldn't say that affirmatively for 640. I, I can get back to you on it, though. There are steps. I believe there's also a side entrance into the building, at least one, because it, it occupies an entire quarter of the block. Right. Um, so there's, um, I know that, and I can check on you uh, on that. But they're going to be compliant. So if there needs to be accessibility created, it will be. Right, and 644 is compliant. HPD approved it, and the, there is a side entrance that does not have steps. Thank you. In terms of the uh, building service workers, do they earn sufficient income so that they could live in this affordable housing, or do they? 32 BJ. They're unionized. They're union. And, and they get health benefits and Of pensions. course. Okay. So 32 BJ. In terms of the MDG contractor, is that an MWBE? They are not themselves that I know of. They, they do use um, MWBEs, sub, subs, and other affiliates. And uh, in terms of the makeup of your particular nonprofits, uh, are there MWBE uh, leaders in your institutions or board members? Well, sorry, sorry. Our, it, yes, I would be one MWB, of them. <laughs> MWBE isn't the correct term, but are there minorities or women who are executives or uh, on the boards of your uh, nonprofits? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, on our, and for UHAB, I'm the director of operations and the general counsel. Um, and on our board, we also have representation. Uh, and uh, actually, our CFO is Ecuadorian so would and a you female. Con would you consider that 50% or what percentage would you say? Of the leadership in yep. our organization? It's about the leadership. Oh, so I, I would probably say a third. Okay. 
And for yours? Well, our president is Alexis Sewell. I'm a woman and president of Settlement Housing Fund. <laughs> Around 50% of our senior team is um, female, 20% uh, minority, and uh, similar representation on our board. Uh, thank you. Uh, for these projects and uh, the construction loan value on 644 is, give me one moment. Sorry, at 640 is 25 mil. So you, you're planning to spend $25 million at 640? Um, if you have, yeah, Sorry. if you have. Approximately, how? yes. That's, that's that's city capital. Great. And so how, what is your local hire requirement? Our, our local hiring requirement? So for the folks who are going to do the work, that $25 million in work, ostensibly folks will get hired to do that work. How many people from the community will be have an opportunity to I do that? I have to ask MDG that question. They're our contractor. We're, we're, okay. We don't do the actual. We will also want the contact information so that uh, Council Member Levine can let folks know about the $25 million in jobs in his community. Sure. Uh, if you can also just share any additional financing, whether it's HTC, LIHTC, private equity, just if you can share that later. Sure. Uh, uh, I, I can add quickly to that and say that CPC is going to be the, the, the private lender. And then we plan to apply for AHC subsidy for the purchasers to go towards their purchase prices as well as to offset the, um, the, the other banks, the other lending capital. Great. I would like, so please submit the additional items. Uh, at that time, the, the hearing will be officially closed. Okay, we are going to apparently uh, close the hearing now, uh, seeing no other people here to testify on this item. And uh, that concludes this hearing. Thank you. So we're now closing the hearing on land use items 184 and 185. We want to thank uh, Council Member Levine for uh, thank you. participating. And uh, we had left the vote open on prior land use items. And uh, I now instruct the committee council to call the roll. Gibson. I vote aye. Thank you, Chair. The land use items are approved by a vote of four in the affirmative, zero negatives, and no abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee. This meeting is hereby adjourned.